Hello, my name is Finn Dingle. I go to SSAS and I'm 13. Our first scripture passage today comes from the 24th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning with the 13th verse. Now on the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, what things, they replied. The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was the prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all of the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucify him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, this is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women in our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow the heart to believe all the prophets have declared. What is not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interrupted to them the things about himself and all the scriptures. All, as they came near to the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So, they, so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he broke bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. But their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, We are not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scripture to us. That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven. They found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, "The the Lord has risen indeed, and appeared to Simon." And they told us what had happened on the road and how it had made him known in the breaking of bread. Our second scripture today comes from the twelfth chapter of the Gospel of Luke, beginning in the forty-ninth verse. I have come to cast fire upon the earth. And how I wish it were already ablaze. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. By your grace, O God, and through your mercy, we pray that you will allow these words to come to point to the word just read and to the word made flesh in Jesus the Christ. For we pray this in his name. Amen. I have come, <clears throat> Jesus said, to bring fire to the earth. I have come to bring fire to the earth. On June 19, 1623, a baby boy was born to a young French couple and they named him Blaise, Blaise Pascal. It was not long after into Blaise Pascal's childhood that it was discovered that he had a brilliant mind, especially for mathematics. At age eight, he began to discover properties of geometry without ever having looked at a geometry book. At the age of 18, he invented one of the first mechanical calculators. Shortly after that, developed some of the early theories on barometric pressure. And by the age of 30, he had created the calculus of probabilities. My guess is he scored pretty high on his SATs. <laughs> Pascal died at the age of 39. He was one of the most brilliant minds to grace the 17th century, or any century for that matter. No one who studies mathematics can get away without knowing the name of Blaise Pascal. But it's not only in the field of mathematics that one discovers 
the name of Blaise Pascal, for it was in his early 30s, through a series of events that occurred in and around him, that Pascal took the great leap of faith and embraced the Christ of Christianity, and for the last eight years of his life, retired to a monastery and devoted most of his remaining days to writing and publishing some of the more brilliant essays of faith and philosophy and the knowledge of God that have up until that point been composed. He had turned his mind and heart over to the great pursuit of following this Christ. Over those years, Pascal posited what came to be known later as Pascal's wager, a rationale for believing in which he said, if God does not exist, one will lose nothing by believing in him, while if he does exist, one might lose everything by not believing. He continued, we are thus compelled to gamble. Many wondered at how such a brilliant mind like Pascal, who seemed to have the mathematical world at his fingertips, could leave it all in order to focus his life on the world of the spirit. And it wasn't until after Pascal died that they began to understand in part why, because it was after his death when they went through his belongings that they found a coat that he often wore. And inside the coat, Pascal had sewn into the lining a piece of paper. It was a paper dated November 23rd, 1654, the day when Pascal had had a deep spiritual experience. And on this paper, sewn into his coat, where it would rest right next to his heart, he wrote this word, fire. Fire. And then after fire, he wrote, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of philosophers and scholars, certainty, certainty, feeling, joy, peace. Pascal had had an experience of spiritual fire, an experience so intense that he could see that the world's greatest certainty was God. And it was this certainty that led him to discover, maybe for the first time, the experience of joy and peace. So real was this moment that he kept it sewn next to his heart. Fire is what he wrote. And it was this fire that engulfed his life the rest of his days. I came, Jesus said, to bring fire to the earth. Which may explain a little of what happened when those two disciples of Jesus were making their way down the road to Emmaus. Strange things had happened in Jerusalem. The rabbi to whom they had dedicated their life and learning had been arrested, put before a kangaroo court, tried, convicted, and dragged before the Roman consulate, and sentenced and crucified, all like that. These disciples are dazed. They don't know what to do. Resurrection rumors are in the air and then this stranger makes his way alongside of them, and Scripture says the stranger began to interpret to them all of what Moses and the prophets had been saying. This stranger, whom they came to realize later was the resurrected Christ, provides them this little Bible study on the way to Emmaus. Now, this is one Bible study at which I would have loved to have been present the resurrected Jesus explaining how the law and the prophets all come together in the person of the crucified and risen one. I would have loved to have been there, not only to take notes, but because later these two disciples say to each other, were not our hearts burning? Were not our hearts burning? We're not our hearts burning with fire in the presence of the risen one. We're not our hearts burning when he taught us how this whole thing comes together. I have come to bring fire, Jesus says. I have come to, to set your hearts on fire. And the fire comes, it seems, when we understand how it all comes together. Physicists over the last few decades have been intrigued to wonder about what they call the unified theory or the theory of everything, thinking that perhaps there is a singular theory that explains all the other theories of physics, general relativity, quantum mechanics. Is there a cause behind all the causes? When the theory of the Big Bang grew in acceptance over the scientific community, it left this big question, is there something before the Big Bang? Is there, is there something or someone who sets off the explosion and propelled the universe into motion? Is there an explanation how it all comes together? Because maybe 
That's where the fire is. Fire, Pascal wrote, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of philosophers and scholars. Certainty, 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 feeling, joy, peace. Sounds like he had come upon the theory of everything. Were not our hearts burning, those disciples said, when the resurrected one put all those pieces together? Sounds like they too had come upon that theory of everything, and maybe that's what Jesus was trying to get us to understand when they put him up for his oral defense and they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? What's the commandment that holds it all together, Jesus? What's the theory of everything? Jesus says, oh, it's not one, it's two, theory of everything is two commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. It all rests, Jesus says, on those two commandments. Love God, love neighbor, fire. Love your neighbor, love your enemy, love the stranger, love the sick, love the lonely, love the unlovable, Love the one you don't understand. Fire. When Paul can see the church at Corinth starting to fall apart over squabbles, over spiritual superiority, over who knows more, over who is more mature, over who has the best answer, Paul says, knock it off. He says, here's the deal, there's one thing. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I hand over my bodies that I may boast, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Sounds like the theory of everything to me. When the resurrected Jesus pulls Peter aside alongside the shore of Galilee, he asks him one simple and profound and life-changing question. He asks him this. He asks him, do you love me? He asks him that question three times. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? as if that was the only question that mattered. When the self-described heathen and playboy Malcolm Muggeridge gave way to the loves of God and converted to the faith and took communion for the first time in a small steeple church in Sussex, England, he said, it's rather like when you fall in love with a woman and ask her to marry you, you know there are no more questions to be asked. When the apostle in 1 John when, when the apostle in 1 John says, whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love, and that when we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us, it sounds like the theory of everything. Martin Luther King in his great sermon on loving your enemies said it plain and simple, love is the most durable power in the world. This creative force so beautifully exemplified in the life of our Christ is the most potent instrument available in humanity's quest for peace. This Earth Day weekend makes me think of the great John Muir, founder of the Sierra Club and protector of some of the great American national parks, when he said, we all flow from one fountain. All are expressions of one love. God does not appear and flow out only from narrow chinks and round board wells here and there in favored races and places, but he flows in grand undivided currents, shoreless and boundless over creeds and forms and all kinds of civilizations and peoples and beasts, saturating all and fountainizing all. Sounds like the theory of everything. In the movie City Slickers, Mitch Robbins, the character played by Billy Crystal, along with some of his friends, are going through a midlife crisis, and they decide to seek refuge and counsel on a dude ranch out west. They're trying to find themselves, and they're not having much luck. The big event while they're out there is a cattle drive that's led by an old crusty cowboy named Curly, played by Jack Palance. And while they're on the cattle drive, Mitch rides up along Curly, alongside Curly, and 
Curley, who's seen a thousand men like Mitch come out to his dude ranch to find themselves, says, you want to know what the secret to life is? And Mitch says, yeah, what's the secret to life? And Curley says, this, it's this. He holds up his index finger, and Mitch says, the secret to life is your finger. No, says Curley, the secret to life is one thing, just one thing. Stick to that one thing, and nothing else matters. And Mitch says, yeah, so what's the one thing? And Curley says, that's what you have to figure out. And that's what the world keeps trying to do. It keeps trying to figure out the one thing, the theory of everything, the unified principle. We are in this perpetual midlife crisis, groping around for the meaning of life, looking for the one answer. Some say it's Republicans, some say it's Democrats, some say it's more taxes, some say it's less taxes, some say it's more immigrants, some say it's less immigrants, some say it's Black Lives Matter, some say it's Blue Lives Matter, some say it's guns, some say it's not guns, some say it's woke, some say it's not woke, some say it's more books, less books, no books, some say it's climate, some say it's not the climate, and the world falls further and further apart. And Jesus says, knock it off. Because something happened that day when those confused and wandering disciples heard the stranger teach them. Because he seemed to pull it all together. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist. It doesn't take a nuclear physicist to figure out what he said. Whoever does not love does not know God. For God is love. And we're not our hearts burning. John Wesley, who along with his brother Charles Wesley were the founders of the great spiritual tradition of Methodism, the Methodist Church. John Wesley, when it all finally came together, sat down and wrote, I felt my heart strangely warmed. Which may have been what happened that day on that bus it was a bus in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. John Williams was the bus driver driving his bus on one of those bone-chilling 10-degree Wisconsin days that we've all escaped from. He pulled up at the stop to let the next group of travelers on, one being a pregnant woman with tattered coat, torn socks, and no shoes. No shoes. No shoes. 10 degrees. No shoes. John looked in the mirror to see where the woman sat and wondered what he was going to do. This was, after all, another human being, 10 degrees, no shoes. Was she an immigrant? Was she a Democrat? Was she a Republican? Was she black, white, or brown? Was she woke, not woke? Was she gay, straight, bi, trans? Did she subscribe to CRT? None of those questions came to John's mind, and apparently none of those questions came to Frank Daly's mind, the 14-year-old sitting in the back of the bus. For John could see in his rearview mirror the young Frank Daly, 14-year-old Frank Daly, standing up and approaching the frozen pregnant woman in his hands, the pair of shoes that seconds before had been on his feet. Here, said the boy, Try these. And John Williams' heart was strangely warm. Wasn't it Pierre Teilhard de Chardin who said, someday after we have mastered the winds, the waves, the tides, and the gravity, we shall harness for God finally the energies of love. And then, for the second time in the history of the world, we will have discovered fire. Let us pray. Oh God, we get so distracted by all those things that we think are more important than love. We lose ourselves and all the little theories, and forget the theory of everything. Allow us your grace to discover it once again. In Christ's name, amen.